2020. Great to be with all of you this morning. My name is Brian Hopper, and I have the privilege of serving here as our campus pastor here in Annapolis. I want to welcome all of you to our gathering this morning, especially want to welcome those of you that are joining us online. We're so glad that you're here with us and that we're all together. Looking forward to spending a few minutes with you here, just jumping into the Word. As you know, we've been in this series called He Changed Everything, the Life of Jesus. And I don't know if you put this together yet or not, but we've been actually traveling through the Gospels, uh, looking at the life of Jesus, that everywhere Jesus went, everything that he did, he brought about change. And uh, last week we talked about prayer, and today uh, we're going to take a look at how I believe Jesus changed our understanding, our perception of reality. No small task. Now, I know, I love what Greg always says. He says, you know, there's one person that Jesus is trying to reach here today, and that's me. So I hope that you can say it's you, and that our time together as we look in God's word would actually bring about change that would help us become more like him. So would you bow your heads with me? Let me pray for our time here together, and we'll, we'll jump in. Well, Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We, we sing of these truths of your peace and your love we sing of your power, and uh, Lord, today as we gather here in your name, it's our desire collectively that we would see you in new ways, that Jesus, that perhaps today you would speak to us in a fresh way, a way that would help us be reminded of your presence and your power, your love, your grace, your peace in our lives. So Lord, collectively, we submit to you here now, and we ask that the power of your word would speak to us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I, uh, I have a younger brother, he's about five years younger than I am, and uh, as only two brothers could growing up, we used to play practical jokes on each other all the time. Most of it was pretty harmless, although there were some instances where we would really kind of get at each other, and if you have a, a sibling, you know sometimes how those things can go, or if you've got small kids, you know how those things could go. But uh, as I was thinking about this, I love a good practical joke. And uh, playing a good practical joke on my brother was always one of those fun things for me. And as I was thinking about this week's message, I was reminded uh, of this TV show that came back out in the late 90s, early 2000s called Punk. You might have heard of it, might remember it, going OG here, going old school. And um, uh, this show in particular, what I loved about it was Ashton Kutcher would kind of set unsuspecting celebrities up and cause them to believe what they were experiencing was true. All the time it was a hoax, it was a ruse. And uh, it was always fun to watch. And so my, one of my favorite episodes was one involving Justin Timberlake, because how could that be bad? And uh, JT, and uh, just thinking about Justin Timberlake and watching him. And so I've got to uh, put together a little clip of this one episode where uh, Justin is led to believe that the IRS is confiscating all of his personal belongings to pay a tax bill of $900,000. This is fantastic. This is good comedy. So take a look at this and just get a feel for it. I want you to watch Justin as you watch this and look at his reactions of what happens. Go ahead and play this, this little play highlight. <laughs> yeah, how fun. I mean, at his expense, right? And we get to see, like, just see Justin and... Uh, led to believe this is the case. And, you know, I'm thinking like, man, he can't get his dog. Of course, they lead him to believe his dogs are, and he calls his mom. I know this was like 20 years ago, but man, I'm like, you're calling your mom? Help me, mom. It's just so, so funny. Now, the beauty of this is, is if you're watching this show, you know it's a hoax. You know it's a hoax. You know that Ashton Kutcher's in a van around the corner and he's speaking into the earphones of the, the supposed IRS agents, leading them to try to convince Justin Timberlake that it's, it's real. But you and I watching that know it's a hoax. And here's the deal. This is, this is what I believe. I believe that every day you and I get punked. You and I every day, we get punked by the world to believe that what this life is about, what the world's happening, the things that we experience is all that there is. That the Lord, uh, he is in control and yet the world would have us believe otherwise. And so whether something's happening in your life that's tragic or hard, it's kind of like it's easy to be dismayed. Look how Justin Timberlake responded when he thought this was actually happening. He was stressed, he was dismayed. He was shocked, right? I mean, he just had his hand in his head. You saw it. 
And unfortunately, I think that's how most of us live. Most of us go around believing that this world, this life, is all that there is. And what we have and what we're doing, whether it's good or bad, is actually, that's it. But the reality is, we're getting punked. Now, when Jesus showed up on the scene, what Jesus did was, he told the truth. He came back and he pulled back the curtain of reality and said, whatever you think is going on is not it. The reality is there's something bigger, there's something grander, there's something so pervasive that's happening around you, and unless you have eyes to see or ears to hear, you're going to completely miss this. And that one thing, that bigger thing that's happening is called the kingdom of God. God's kingdom in Jesus was being revealed to all of humanity. And what I want to do this morning is I'd like for us to spend a few minutes just looking at three parables that illustrate for us that Jesus taught as to what this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God is actually like. And in doing so, my hope is what I believe, at least this week as I've been preparing for this, what the Lord has done in my own life is he's just pulled back the curtain and reminded me, this is not what you think. This is what's going on. This is reality. So if you have your Bibles, if you'd open up, let's take a look at Matthew 13, verses 31 through 33. And in this passage of Scripture, actually in all of Matthew 13, Jesus teaches seven parables all about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, what we know is, is that Jesus in his earthly ministry, once the word got out, once his uh, fame and his um, uh, people began to know who he was and the opposition increased, Jesus changed his teaching methodology from being very direct, very confrontational, very pointed, and began to uh, uh, teach truth in the form of a parable. And so what we see here as we look at these parables is that he's trying to take something that is very familiar to the people, the audience at hand, and help them understand something that is not very familiar, that is the kingdom of heaven. Let's take a look in verse 31 of chapter 13. Jesus presented another parable to them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds. But when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants, and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can nest in it in its branches. He goes on to say, and I'll read this other one, passage 2 and 33. He says, and he spoke another parable to them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now, this idea of Jesus kind of masking truth, he announced to the disciples in Mark 4, verse 11, what he said was, he said, for you, the kingdom of heaven is being made known to you. He says that the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but those on the outside, everything else, they're going to hear it in parables. And again, the idea was that if you had ears to hear or eyes to see, if you understood what he was saying, that was an invitation for you to be part of his kingdom. And so this idea of parables, we're all familiar with. In fact, of all the teachers, Jesus' parables are probably some of the most widely known stories in all of history. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to know about Jesus' parables. Most people can tell you the story of the Good Samaritan, whether they follow Jesus or not. He was a master teacher, and he used parables as a way to get people to think and to act differently. Of all of his teaching, parables represent about a third of all the time that he spent teaching as recorded in the Gospels. So this is a big deal. This idea of these parables are big. Now, what we see in this particular parable is that this idea is like a simile. A simile is a way that you're going to, again, you're going to take knowledge of something that you know, and you're going to refer to something that you don't know so that you better understand what it is. In this case, a mustard seed that's going to be likened to the kingdom of heaven. And so let's take a look at this for a second. So Uh, In the Greco-Roman world, everyone knew that the mustard seed was the smallest seeds. In fact, most scholars believe that this was a variety of the mustard seed called a black mustard seed. And it was about a little bit larger than the size of a pinhead. And if you took that tiny little seed and implanted it in the ground, it would germinate in about five days. 
And from this tiny little seed over the course of a lifetime, its lifetime, it would grow to a tree that would be about 10 feet tall and would have massive branches along the base of the tree that provided the shelter and the refuge for the birds that came and nested in it. And so Jesus is likening this kingdom of heaven to this idea of something that's very small and hidden to something that actually is very pervasive, very big, very identifiable and present. He's trying to teach the disciples and the audience in that day that this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, it still doesn't answer for us, what is the kingdom of heaven? Okay, we're starting to understand a little bit what it's supposed to be like, but what exactly is the kingdom of heaven? Most of us would say that the kingdom of heaven is where the rule of God and the reign of God are expressed. It's an invisible kingdom. It's not a physical place. It's everywhere that God's rule and his reign is expressed. Uh, I love the way that Dallas Willard said it. He said that God's, it's God's reign through God's people over God's place. So everywhere there's rule, everything that represents God, that's where the kingdom of heaven is. Let me see if I can illustrate it a different way. When our girls were small and we were raising our girls uh, up in the house, we had kind of house rules. We had house rules. And so uh, my wife and I, in trying to raise our girls right, we, would, we put into practice the ways that we thought our household should run. Do the laundry this way. Girls help out with the dishes. Uh, we had rules that said there were certain words that the girls couldn't use in our house. They go to school and they hear, hear different words. And they come back and they use that language. And we'd be like, uh-uh. That's not the way. We're, we don't use that language here. We don't talk that way. That's not the way it works in our house. Instead, we're going to do rules this way, or we're going to use words this way. At the time, and you might have a rule like this with your kids where there's a cell phone table. Hey, when we eat dinner, cell phone's got to go on the table. For us, our girls, it was Game Boys. Okay, put the Game Boy down. Look at us. As brief as it is, let's engage around the table and have a conversation while we're trying to eat dinner. We had rules that govern our house. My wife and I, we had rules about how we were going to spend our money how much money we we're going to give away, where we we're going to try to make some investments, where we we're going to, how, how we we're going to spend and the things that we we're going to spend it on. And so these rules governed the way we operate in our house. Well, it makes sense then if God is perfect, God is just, God is holy, God is good, that he too would have rules about what would happen in his kingdom, right? So if God is good and perfect and holy, then everything that God would do would be good and perfect and holy. If he's just, then everything would be right. And so what we see is everywhere those things start to reveal themselves is a reflection of God's kingdom. And now what we see is, is you say, okay, well, I think I kind of understand that. Let me see if I can illustrate it for you briefly. Because this idea of this rule and the reign, sometimes, you know, this kingdom of heaven talk is very abstract, right? It's, it's a little... It's like, what are you talking about? Like, how does this practically play out? So if you, could, if you would, let me take a couple minutes, because in my mind, as I was thinking about this week, it's like, if I see it, sometimes it helps me understand it. So let me see if I can do like a biblical quick survey of a picture of what I think the kingdom of heaven looks like. So the kingdom of heaven starts with a king. You can't have a kingdom if you don't have a king. And so the king sits on his throne. And this is my little throne here. And we'll put some arms on there. And it looks like a, uh, a mid-century lounge chair. That's kind of nice, actually. Well, it looks pretty good. I didn't know that. We got, and the king. So Psalm 103, 19 says that the Lord established his throne in the heavenlies and his kingdom rules over all things. And so God, before time began, in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, set up his kingdom. And the three of them ruled over their kingdom long before there was creation, long before there was earth. And then what happened was, and we see this in Genesis 1 and 2, because what we see is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth are synonymous. We see that the kingdom of heaven, Adam and Eve, as they walked in the gardens of Eden, they actually experienced the presence of God. And there was no darkness, there was no sin, no sickness, no brokenness. They experienced perfect relationship with God. They experienced wholeness and everything that was right and good and true. And so what we see is there's this kingdom that belongs to God in the heavenlies. And he ruled over the heavenlies. And he also, at that time, ruled over the earth. And so we got a kingdom of heaven, heaven, 
and a kingdom of earth. Now, these two got separated when sin entered in the picture because what happened was Adam and Eve said, you know what? God, for all this goodness, for all these things, we're just, we're tempted to go a different direction. And so we're going to rebel. We're going to say no to all your goodness and we're going to choose to do our own thing. And do you know what mankind did? Set up his own throne. He said, I'm going to set up my throne. I'm going to be the king. Jesus, we know you're the king. God, you're the king, but I'm going to set up my throne, my king, and I'm going to do life my way. So thanks, God, for all that, but this is the way I'm going to do it. And, of course, we know that God said, you can't do that. That's not what this is about. It's not how I created you. And because you've chosen to do that, I've got to separate myself. And so the heavens and the earth separated. And so God's continued to reign in the heavenlies while the prince of darkness, Satan himself, the enemy, ruled in the earth. And all throughout history, what we see is that God continually provide for his people as a way to try to point them back to the way to live in the kingdom. And that was all external. That was on the tablets. That was through the law and through the, through, uh, the ways in which God revealed himself until the perfect time when King Jesus came. And Jesus said, guess what? Like his beard there? <laughs> Fellas, you thought you had a good beard? Jesus was perfect, man. He had a, he had a perfect beard. Whatever that looked like. Probably looked like that. Jesus shows up in Mark 1.15 and he says, the time has come. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe. I, in the person of me, Jesus, are now bringing everything that the heavenlies had to bear down into the earth. In fact, even before that, we know in Philippians 2, that Jesus, who existed with the Father on the throne, decided to leave his heavenly place and leave everything that was perfect and good and to take on the limitations of flesh and be born as a child. Think about this, an infant in the hands of a teenage girl. A king who governed the world, the creation, left that throne to come to earth so that you and I would have glimpses and be reminded of what this kingdom looks like. And so Jesus shows up and he says, I'm here, Mark, the time is fulfilled. Remember in Luke 4, when Jesus reads the scrolls, he gathers around and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, the father, anointed me, Jesus, to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight of the blind. And he set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And like a king would do, he rolled up the scrolls and he sat down signifying that he's the king. And this is what he came to do. He came to push back all the darkness, all the brokenness, all the sin that exists in your life, my life, and the world's life. Now, the disciples didn't understand this. They thought Jesus was coming. They saw what he was doing, and they thought he was going to set up a different kind of kingdom. They thought he was going to go to Jerusalem and kick Rome out and restore Israel back to their rightful place. And so they were deceived. They were punked, if you will to believe that something else was going on. And so Jesus kind of tried to correct this all the time. The Pharisees came to him one time and said, is this when you're restoring the kingdom? And Jesus said, no, the kingdom's not going to be, oh, here it is, oh, there it is. The kingdom's in me. I'm the kingdom. I'm bringing the kingdom to bear. And if you don't see that, you're missing it. Guess what? You're punked. So the disciples, even John the Baptist was confused. Are you the one, Jesus? Are you the expected one? And what did Jesus do? He replied back and he said, look, the, the blind are getting their sight. Those who are lame are walking. Those who have been possessed are set free. John, this is evidence that the kingdom is here. And it's in me and I'm revealing it to all the people. This is why Jesus said, seek what? Seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. That you and I are called to seek all of that that our hearts yearn for what's good. Our hearts yearn for what's right. When Jesus said, when you pray, pray what? Pray that the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, that we would experience that. And so Jesus, as he taught kingdom and kingdom and kingdom and kingdom to all his people, he was trying to point a picture to this reality that was existing there. Now, what we know is the ultimate expression of God's glory and the power of the kingdom comes in the cross. And even, even Jesus himself, even the world at that point, when he met with Pilate, he spent time with Pilate. And Pilate said, uh, you're being accused that you're a lord, you're a king. Are, are, you, are you a king? And Jesus said, it is as you say so. And then despite the Jews, what, what's the sign they put up on the cross? King of Jews. 
Of course, they did that because the Romans did that because they were trying to get at the Jews. But instead, it was the truth. God, again, took something that was meant for evil and made it good. And so here what we see is on the cross, in Jesus' death and his crucifixion and his resurrection, he defeats Satan. He defeats the enemy. He crushes the enemy. And all the brokenness, all the sin, all the things that existed are now finally put to rest. Jesus, before he ascended, he gathered his disciples and he said, all authority in heaven and earth has now been what? Given to me. It's all me. So now guess what? I want you to go. I want you to make disciples of all nations. And so he promises to send the Holy Spirit, which he sends. And now the heavenlies, the kingdom of heaven, is now implanted in the seed of the hearts of men and women to be the people of God to go and bring heaven to earth through the power of the Spirit. As we place our faith in him, as we trust Jesus on the cross, that's what we experience. And from the Holy Spirit, we know that the church was birthed, and so we get this great picture where the people of God come together, and we see that all of a sudden, now the people filled with the Holy Spirit have a mission. They've got a focus. They have a calling to say that they've experienced the kingdom themselves, and as they experience the peace, the joy, the love, the goodness of the kingdom, they're called to take that to the world. It's my little world. They're called to take this to the world so that those who are living outside of the reign of Jesus would know that they've been punked, that they've been duped. And if you're in Christ, you know. It's like watching an episode of that TV show. You know what's going on. I know what's going on. And we hopefully have experienced that. Think with me for a second. How did Justin Timberlake respond when he saw Ashton and Kutcher come down that, the, the driveway? Yeah, man, he smiled. Oh, are you serious? This isn't real? Oh, oh man, this is, this, is a, this is not real? Joy, laughter, relief, all of his stress, all of his tension, everything that he was experiencing, being dismayed, loss of hope, thinking, what am I going to do, is now gone. It's been replaced with joy, with peace, with laughter. This is what Jesus says. This is what happens when the kingdom comes on you. I was thinking in my own life recently, just as finding myself to be, really had this low kind of grade of just anger, just frustration over things. And I don't know how it works for you, but oftentimes, I, I mean, I get punked just like everybody else. And it doesn't take long for me to start to imagine or think that the things that are happening, the things that are going wrong, are somehow part of some big meta-narrative that's negative. And so I, I found myself in this place where I'm like, even as I was preparing for this, studying this, I'm thinking, Lord, this doesn't seem right. And so what I remember, what we do, what I do is say, okay, what do I know to be true? <laughs> what do I know to be true? Is God on his throne or isn't he? He is. Is God, has he given me his spirit in me? He has. Do I have the power of the word that instructs me and informs me? I do. And so what is true? What is true is what I might be experiencing right now is not reality. And as I have kind of exercised and gone through those steps, I'm reminded of what is true and the effect that it has on me is like, whew, I can relax. I can rest. I don't need to be angry. I don't need to be frustrated. I don't need to be mad at my neighbor. I don't need to be grouchy. I don't need to be looking out for me because here's what happens when I do that. Guess what? I'm sitting on the throne. I'm on the throne. If you're not experiencing the joy and the peace that Jesus offers you because of his kingdom, because he's the king, guess what? You're probably on the throne. If you're being led to believe that your life amounts to the absolute, uh, the totality of all that you own and all that you do, guess what? You're being punked and you're on the throne. If you're feeling led like you got to keep up with the Joneses, you got to keep adding to your, your portfolio, or you, you're doubting whether or not God can actually break into your life and heal the relationship that, is, uh, that you're experiencing because of the distance of family or friends, guess what? You're being punked. Jesus is pulling that curtain back and saying, no, 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 no. This is just like JT getting him to pay a $900,000 tax bill. This is not real. Here's what's real. Jesus says, I'm real. I'm bringing it. I'm bringing joy and peace and love into your life. And I want you to experience that. 
And when we surrender, when we get off the throne, that's when you and I experience that. Now, Jesus teaches this in the parables. Jesus takes this seed idea and he says, this is what it's like. It starts off small with me and it's hidden and nobody sees it and nobody knows it. But it grows to be something massive. It grows to be a tree when it's fully lit. And right now, you and I have the opportunity to see and experience the kingdom in small pieces. We're still in that trajectory because Jesus promises that he's coming again, that he's going to set it up and do away with all of this stuff that's wrong. And you and I can have hope in that. This isn't home. (laughs) This is not home. This is not where we ultimately end up. With Jesus, if you're in Christ, then you have a hope that that kingdom is going to set up. And Jesus says it's like a mustard seed. He goes on to say it's like this leaven. With this leaven idea real quick, it's like you have a batch of dough that's fermented, and they would rip off a little piece of that, and they would mix it into a larger batch of dough so that it permeated all of the dough. And so where the, the, the mustard seed in the tree uh, simile, is the uh, parable is talking about the growth and the visibility of it, the, uh, the leaven and the dough actually speaks to the permeability of it. It influences everything that's going so that your life is influenced like mine, where you and I go into the world, we're bringing it to bear into the darkness. And so we're permeating the life, we're permeating the world like the leaven does to a dough. And that's what Jesus is trying to illustrate there. And then thirdly, we look at this third uh, parable in verse verse 44. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Do you know what I love about this? He stumbles into a treasure and then he buries it again. He's like, man, I just found the biggest treasure. You guys have no idea what I just found. I'm going to bury and hide it again. And then I'm going to go and sell everything I have because that treasure is so valuable, so important, so big that it's worth way more than everything I have. Think about for a second, if if you hit the lottery, what's the number on the ticket that's got to exceed the totality of everything that you own that you would sell it all in order to have that ticket? Millions? Thousands? couple thousand, that's probably my ticket, wouldn't take much. But the idea is that this treasure is so, the value of this treasure is so important that he would happily sell everything he had. In other words, when he found this treasure, he would actually, whatever his life was about, he would give it all up so that he could have this treasure. That's what Jesus is calling you and me to. That's what he says, he said, when you find me, Jesus says, The joy that you experience when you find relief for your soul, when you find healing for your body, when your salvation is secure, it it results in inexpressible joy. Think about for a second, how did JT respond when, yeah, when when he saw Ashton Kutcher come down? He was so elated, wasn't he? That's the kind of joy that you and I can experience. And if you're not experiencing that kind of joy and peace in light of your circumstances, guess what? You haven't found the treasure. Or at least you've forgotten. What Jesus is saying, no, this treasure is for you and you can experience it and this is what he wants you to have. So we see these three simple parables that have such an impact over what's going on. This treasure of the value and we celebrate in response to that and that the invitation to abandon whatever we think our life is about so that we're not being punked, we're not believing What the world is telling you is the way that you should live or should be. Instead, what God is saying, I want you to live out my kingdom. I want you to live the joy, the peace, the love, the goodness that he has for you and experience that. And then I want you to take that to the world. Now, in in closing, as I was thinking about this, I thought, okay, this sounds very general. It sounds, you know, it's still kind of, all right, Hop, I think I kind of got it. It's still a little bit up there. not really sure what I'm supposed to do. How does this play out? And uh, as I was trying to think through this, I was reminded of my missions trip to India last fall. Uh, A small group from us went over to India to visit Joseph at ICBM. And uh, part of our trip was to teach some pastors. And so we went out into the jungles, out into the rural areas to meet with some of the smaller churches. And one of the churches we went to was about the size of half this stage. And uh, it was packed. We walked in there. There were some pastors in there and had an opportunity to teach uh, some pastors, which I was so thankful for. And Pardon me, the women were ministered to and the children were ministered to. And um, afterwards, Joseph was like, okay, got to get back in the bus and we got to head back. 
And as I was preparing to leave, one of the pastors came up to me and asked me if I'd pray for him. And so, of course, I'm absolutely sure. And, uh, and so I did. And so in India, when you pray for somebody, you, you put your hand on their head. Here, you might put your hand on their shoulder. If it's a spouse or a loved one, you'd hold their hand. But in India, you put your hand on their head. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but this is, this is incredibly personal. This is kind of like, this is a big deal. And so, okay, put my hand on his head and just prayed. And, you know, we had to, at the time, he spoke a little bit of English, so I knew a little bit of what to pray for. And then uh, when I opened my eyes after praying, there was a line that had formed, a line of women. Yeah, I was like, okay, I thought we were just, okay, I thought I was on the bus, you know. Okay, all right, let's pray. So now this line of women are present and asking for prayer, and there's no interpreter, and there's no English. And so I just remember just praying for these women. And um, about the third or fourth one, I opened my eyes, and here in front of me was this older woman. She must have been in, probably in her 80s. Her skin all dried and wrinkly from the heat in India. Beautiful woman. And, um, and I looked at this woman, and I thought in the sense, I thought, man, I've, I, I feel like she should pray for me. <laughs> like, I actually wanted her to pray for me. I thought, Lord, who am I to pray for this woman, this saint? This is beautiful. And so I, I put my hand on her, on her head, and I remember thinking, like, Lord, I don't know what to pray. What does this woman need prayer for? Like, Lord, what, what do you want this whim, woman to know about you to pray? And, uh, and by faith, I just started to pray. And it came to mind as I was praying, I was thinking, like, pray the kingdom. Like, pray the kingdom. And so I just began to pray that the Lord would bring peace into this woman's life, that she would experience the Lord's goodness in her life, that if there was any injustice, that it would be made right in her life, and that she begin to experience the fullness and the wholeness and the presence of Jesus. And about halfway through, I, I, I just lost it. I just was overcome with emotion. I was like, oh, man, you can tell I'm sweating. It's hot. I was like, Lord, wow, this is what it means to bring your kingdom to bear. I'm on the other side of the world praying for an 80-year-old woman and thinking, Lord, what we want is your kingdom to come to earth right here, right now. This is what it means to bring the kingdom to bear. It means that you and I would live out the life of the kingdom, the king, that we'd bring goodness where we go. We'd bring justice where we go. We'd bring truth where we go. And that those that are outside the, 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 the reign of Jesus that are still in darkness, who are still punked, that you and I would be agents of the kingdom that would pull back the curtain and point people to Jesus. See, when we preach the gospel, when we bring the gospel, we're declaring God's rule in their life. And this is exactly, as kingdom people, what you and I are called to do. My prayer today is that we as a church, we as a people, would live out the kingdom. That we would be the kind of people who practically brought about the goodness and the life and the truth. And that we'd be motivated to continue to advance God's kingdom in the hopes that it's coming back again. And in the meantime, we get to experience the joy and the love and the peace that he extends to us. Would you bow your heads? Let me pray for us and ask the Lord Jesus as we come before you as your people. Lord, we confess how easily punked, how easily duped we are into believing what the world is trying to tell us about reality, about truth. And thank you, Jesus, that you came. You came to give us life. You came to show us the way. And you came to reveal to us your truth. And so, Lord, I pray for us as a people today. God, if anyone were here who isn't experiencing the power of your kingdom, that, God, you'd break in. That whatever we might be dismayed by, we would release to you. And look to you as our king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords to bring healing and wholeness and truth and righteousness, justice to our lives. And I pray, Lord, by your Spirit's power, you would lead us into the world, into the darkness, to be the light, to be the salt, to be the people who point back to you, that those who are believing in the world would no longer see that they're being punked, but instead see you for your glory. We praise you and we thank you, and we pray this in faith in your name. Amen.